Hello everyone, welcome back to Just Another F1 Podcast here on Apex Motorsport. My name is Roger Smith and this is Season 2, Episode 4. And today I'm delighted to say I'm joined once again by accredited Formula 1 photographer Craig Evans. Craig, thank you for joining me for this one. We just had the Formula 1 Pirelli Grand Premio del Made in Italy di Emilia Romagna 2021 Grand Prix at the Autodroma Internazionale in Enzo di Dino Ferrari in what was the second round of the 72nd running of the FAA Formula 1 World Championship. That's not a mouthful at all, is it? <laughs> no, not it's at not. All. You did very well to yeah. get out. <laughs> we'll ignore the fact that it's the third tech we're doing it. Um, as always, I think we'll just start by playing a little bit of F1 higher or lower. I think both of us have a hundred percent record so far. I I think we can confidently say that both of them records are going today. Yeah, well, sheer luck if they don't. I think. Yeah, yeah, we, we've done we've done well. I think two or three times we've done it. Hundred percent record. We've thrown some tough questions. Craig, we like go first or second today. I'll let the host go first. Host can go first. Okay, so do you want me to ask you the questions yeah, then? Fire away. Okay, uh, we're only going to do two questions today because the, my second one is is quite long. Uh, so the first one is Lewis Hamilton claimed a consecutive 20 front row starts between Belgium 2014 and Italy 2015 but has Erdogan Senna claimed a higher or lower number of consecutive front row finishes or starts sorry so what was, what was Hamilton's? 20 20 I'm going to go lower ok it's actually higher ah oh, damn it it's so, gone it's the gone already gone. <laughs> the first one uh, Erdogan Senna had a consecutive 24 front row starts between Germany 1988 and Australia 1989. It's you pretty impressive, that isn't it? That's mad. It is. It's, it's very impressive, especially the, the field of drivers they had back then. Yeah, and the reliability yeah, of the cars back then as well. Uh, would you like to ask me a question, or do you want you know, the big question next? I'll save the big one till the end because it's it might take a while to get us get it out of the way. Yeah. So. George Russell, the star of Mercedes-Benz's weekend this weekend. <laughs> His car number is 63. So he's car number 63. Yep. Has the channel favourite, Pierre Gasly, entered more or less races than 63? Okay. He joined down to 2017, so that's 18, 19, 20 full seasons. Ooh. There's not much in it. It's, I, I wasn't thinking there's only going to be a few. I'm going to go higher. Higher? Yeah. Correct. Yes. 66. <laughs> oh, 66 I entries. I was about to say 67. Yeah, it's 66 entries okay. compared to the 63 on George Russell's car. That's a very good question. The next good. one's an even better one, I oh, think. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so last week we obviously heard the sad news of the passing of His Royal Highness Prince Philip Duke of Edinburgh. Um, in 1950, his wife, the Queen Elizabeth II, she wasn't queen at the time, but her father, um, King George VI, was. And they said they intended the 1950 British Grand Prix, the only time a reigning monarch has attended a British motor race. I think that's true. Um, oh, wow. That's well, surprising. The, it, it is, actually. Uh, well, there's never been anyone with the first name Philip in F1. There has been three drivers with Duke in their name. Duke Dinsmore entered five Grand Prix, but have Jeff Duke, Entered a higher lower number of Grand Prix races. It's a complete stab in the dark. Yeah, this one, <laughs> I've not heard of either of them. Yeah. Um, so higher or lower than five? Yes. I'm gonna go lower than five. Correct. Yay! He's actually <laughs> entered one race, which was a non-championship race in Sweden, won by Sterling Moss. Jeff Duke was actually an accomplished motorcycle racer, won the six races of the Ironman TT, and including three wins of the Ulster Grand Prix. Uh, Duke Dinsmore entered five in the 500s at the time when it was part of the F1 calendar. That's why they only competed in so few. He entered between 1950 and 1956 with a best finish, a solo finish of 17th, and a share finish of 16th with Roger Ward and Andy Linton. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. That's a really good pub quiz question, that <laughs> one. <laughs> it's like the knowledge that you need to know, but you don't need to know. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So, my question to Richard, the final question I have, so obviously this weekend we saw a Mercedes, a Red Bull Mercedes McLaren podium. The fir- that's the first time we've seen that those three teams on the podium since 2010 at the British Grand Prix. So my question to Richard is, does the podium of Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton and Lando Norris have a higher or lower average age of Lewis Hamilton, 
Mark Webber and Nico Rosberg, which was the last time we saw a Red Bull Mercedes McLaren podium. So it was 20 and that's age at the time of the event. The time, so that was 2010. Yep. I heard something in the commentary about some of the podium that would be the youngest podium, but I don't think Oh, it could be. See, Hamilton throws it off. Norris is yep. Verstappen. Okay, twenty ten. So that was twenty. That was tw- eleven years ago. So it was indeed. Ros. Well, it's Mark Webber and Rosberg. Nico Rosberg. Rosberg retired when he was still youngish for Formula One, but he would have been mid twenties, probably can see the cogs turning yeah can definitely see the cogs turning I'm gonna on this one. I'm gonna go for oh you see Hamilton just throws it yeah, off it's Hamilton's the, the the question in that one who was the third driver 2010 third was Rosberg okay Weber won Hamilton second Rosberg oh Ham- Hamilton's in the podium then as well I'm gonna go for lower lower yeah as in the podium this year. This year is lower, lower age, yes. Is correct. Yes, I'm 100% record. I still thought here. that one would trip you up. So the yeah. average age of the 2021 podium was 26.6 uh, years. And the average age of the 2010 podium was 28.3. Okay. So not much in it. There's, there's not. I shall have to try harder next time to try yeah. and trip Richard up. And I'll, I'll not give you um, questions about... Uh, the 1950s Formula One races. It's a little bit before my time, that one. Just, just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll start chatting about the, we're just going to call it the Imola Grand Prix because I'm not saying that in my full. We'll be about a three hour long podcast if we had to use yeah. that every time. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, we'll start just chatting a little bit about practice. We'll mostly speak about the race, um, but Mercedes seemed to be back on top. Bottas was leading the way in Friday, but then Verstappen topped it on Saturday. Uh, did it look like it was going to be looking like an easy weekend for Mercedes or do you think Red Bull were just holding things back a little bit? I wasn't expecting an easy weekend for Mercedes but the way they've redeveloped the entire rear end of that car since Bahrain and the difference you can see I don't know if you agree with this the difference in that car is spectacular in three weeks that's yeah. why they're seven time world champions because they got it a bit wrong in Bahrain, still managed to win, and now they've redeveloped it, they've made upgrades, they've brought new aero packages, and it, it worked quite well on Friday. Um, I didn't expect a Hamilton pole at all yeah. come Saturday. I thought Red Bull were going to get there. Um, but no, all in all, it was it's going to be a belter of a season if it keeps ebbing and flowing like this. Yeah, it, it definitely will be. We've seen qualifying, uh, both Williams drivers getting to Q2. Latifi actually beating Russell into Q2. I think Martin Brundle got a little bit excited saying that you know, Russell's finally been Jumped beaten. Jumped the gun a <laughs> little, little bit. Little bit. <laughs> and then realised actually there's there's Q2. Um, what do you make of Williams? Do you think they're making good progress? Williams had season? a blinding weekend until the race where it just all went wrong very quickly for them. No, Williams are on the right way. They're going the right way. Um, could we see them fighting for the midfield next year come the the massive regulation changes? Maybe. They've still got a good way to go, but they're definitely putting footsteps in the right direction. I think they mentioned as well over the weekend that they're not really going to be developing this year's car too much, putting their focus to next year. Do you think that will benefit them? Or another team that's down the bottom has, they're not developing. Could you see them too maybe going up to leading in the midfield next year if the other teams aren't putting in as much work at the moment? It depends, and I think development battle this year and next year is going to be key when it comes to working out results because the thing to remember is Hass on developing, neither are Williams now. Well, they are v- very, very, very slowly, minimally. Yeah. It's going to be super interesting to see how that translates to next year because if Red Bull and Mercedes are stuck in a development war this year, they can't focus the assets onto the 2022 car and is that going to hamper them come next year when Ferrari and McLaren have already said we're going to give it a good bit of development this year but then towards the end we are going to focus on 2022 so it's going to be it's going to be interesting it's going to be a good period for for F1 I reckon this coming year especially with 
you know, the, the difference in prize money between ninth and tenth is still huge. You, they might not be picking up any points. Both neither team might pick up any points this season. One point this season could be massive. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you think that maybe if Williams are seeing themselves potentially that tail end of of the points, maybe sitting in eleventh, twelfth, the last few laps of the race, thinking collision ahead might do it, that they might then start turning their focus to this year in order to have have more money available long term because they have recently been taken over but their team that are struggling Simo has they, you know, there are rumours that now even be on the grid and are everyone's favourite William Story of which energy will be coming back do you think that a potential ninth place might be better than you know, spending all this money and having a slight advantage next year when you might still not be fighting for any points I think Williams could definitely sc- scrape some points this year when you look at the circuits we've got coming up because they ran really well in Imola um, which is mainly power. It's, it's a power-focused track. They've obviously got the Mercedes engine in the back of that car, so it, it works well. They did well last year, just missed out on points with Russell. Um, and again, this year, I reckon Russell would have been in the points had he not had that almighty plane crash with Bottas yeah. down into T1. So I think Williams have... They've got a very fine line to tread between focusing on this year's car and focusing on next year's car because if they can get a point and Haas don't, that's about £20 million worth of um, funding and prize prize money. That's a lot of money. I mean, even in F1, that's 20 mil is a lot. That will make a difference. Especially with you know, the budget cap and stuff. Though they are restricted how much they can spend, but it's highly unlikely the NEM teams are spending the full amount down it anyway, so anything will help them last race in Bahrain everyone got really excited about the performance of Yuki Tsunoda this time qualifying he brought out the red flag slightly disappointing Were you, do he, you had a, think, he had a poor weekend this weekend Yuki yeah, do you think that was just sort of he, he maybe got a little bit too excited about last week thinking you know what I can actually come here and fight for points every weekend there's a bit of an experience showing and qualifying this well, time I think round. the thing this week because you've got to remember Bahrain the media and press ran with him and they said oh he's fantastic I mean I'm not saying he's not a great driver he is a fantastic little driver but the way the media and press bigged him up it and it's only his first race that's the thing to remember is it's it was his first race yeah he drove fantastically had a great race I think he let himself down a little bit this weekend with just his mannerisms on track um, he got warned multiple times for corner cutting and kept doing it. Um, it was a wet weekend, so it was the first wet weekend in the car. But no, I think Bahrain was fantastic. Here he'll want to move on um, and build on better races. But I think he he's still got the complete package. And I think he is going to be up there come come this season. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, but then... But we'll get to the checker flag of, of qualifying Hamilton and Pole. We almost seen Landon Norris go on to the front row. I think it was exciting pretty much every Formula One fan seen a McLaren car go P2 in the grid. It was said in purple sectors, I actually thought he was gonna go pole. I was I was shouting in the car on the journey back up to university. I was shouting in the car like, He's gonna do it, he's gonna put it on the front row. And then the lap time got deleted. Yeah, just <laughs> It went on board and he had set two purple sectors and that's when Miss Sky called in saying you know, he, he might be going off a pole here. Obviously last stage I think we missed the you know the the corner or the tra- track limit succeeding because they were excited then instantly as soon as he crossed the line he says that lap time's gonna be deleted and it just deflated the whole qualifying and took away a fantastic lap from Hamilton. More importantly, take away a fantastic lap from Sergio Perez. Starting Perez, to row. me, was the driver of the session come Saturday. Having that accident on Friday, a clumsy accident on Friday with Ocon when the telemetry was down and the team couldn't talk to the car. And then building with it with a good free practice three. And then Perez, seemingly out of nowhere, to go within eight hundredths of Hamilton was was incredible. And we know Perez is is not the best on a Saturday. His strengths come on Sunday. But, no, Perez was fantastic on Saturday. I, I think I've seen a stat somewhere that that was only the third time for Stappen was like, qualified by a teammate to, and when it, since he's joined Red Bull. That sounds about right. That 
I think that shows his performance level, but I, I think again it highlights that second Red Bull seat. His performance level and the fact that the car might be designed favouring one driver, maybe. But that's possibly we're we're not going to say that we're walking on eggshells here. Yes. <laughs> so this is what's being reported, and we're seeing a lot of online. We'll put it, we'll leave it like that. Yeah. Um, Charles Leclerc P four, very impressed with that. Pierre Gasly P five, we impressed with speed of both them drivers. Yeah. Um, Ferrari have seemingly pulled the cat out the bag this year because they are they're up there for the the third best team. I think McLaren are edging it at the minute. Um, the Alpha Tauri has fantastic one lap pace, especially from Gasly. The quest can they convert it in the race? Mm, it's hearsay uh, whether they can or not. But Ferrari are impressed, and I'm massively impressed with Sainz. Yeah, the same. way he settled into that car, it's fantastic. And Valtteri Bottas down in eighth, a disappointing weekend all around for him, especially it's, qualifying. This is why, personally, I think Bottas knows his time's up in that Mercedes car because it, it was it was a typical bad Bottas weekend first in FP1 first in FP2 in there in FP3 and then come qualifying nowhere and then come the race he was he was nowhere as well so that is I think when people say oh Bottas isn't slow, he's, he's not fast enough he's he's not he's not to the level of Hamilton I mean no one really on that grid is to the level of Hamilton but Bottas, his weakness in the Mercedes has been consistency. That's why he hasn't been able to mount a challenge for the championship. Because Hamilton is great everywhere. And when Hamilton has a bad weekend, he finishes second. Yeah, That's well, like he did this weekend. But when Bottas has a bad weekend, he certainly sometimes doesn't score points. And I think that's the biggest difference for me between Hamilton and Bottas. Hamilton's consistency is so much higher... When Bottas is on it, he's up there. He's sometimes quicker than Lewis. But it's it's that consistency, and I think this was a classic bad Bottas weekend. Yeah, I think the one thing with Valtteri Bottas going in the last few seasons in particular is he's always had a really strong start, picking up the first few poles and ones. He hasn't had that this season. I don't know if it's a case of the, the calendar being changed up early on, not having you know, Australia, Barry and being first, Emma coming in... He obviously got the pole there last year. Yeah, he did. Gray. He was he was on pole last year. So I don't know. Maybe maybe the the answer to happen. Russell might give him a bit of a wake up call, thinking the, the spotlights on Russell. Russell, you know, we'll get we'll discuss it in a bit. But it definitely will be after this weekend. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think Bottas he needs to step up his game if he wants to keep that seat because. Do you think he's going to have that seat next year? I I don't think he will, but. I think if Russell makes another few mistakes, Toto's going to say no, despite how good Russell is, because he, I think uh, I, I think Toto Wolff with Farrell have Esteban Ock on the team just to be the simple second yeah. driver. No, I th- I would have loved to have heard that phone call yeah. between Toto Wolff and Russell, because Russell made he made Mercedes' weekend very difficult. Yeah. Not moving offline when Hamilton was lapping him. Having that almighty smash with Bottas and then I think the thing to me was you don't usually see Russell pent up and angry and fired up no. I was amazed when he went over and obviously had uh, a very finished greeting from Bottas I mean he's he's hit the wall at 200 miles an hour nearly so it's it's allowed yeah I was amazed when he went over and and bopped him on the head yeah. I was like he's not are they not going to check he's all right I mean he's just hit that wall at oh god knows what speed no, that was that was the first weekend I can remember where I've seen Russell lose a bit of control. Yeah, which was it was. I mean, it's live sport. I mean, it happens. I mean, I'm not going to say it shouldn't happen, but I I think it it's live sport. We should see these raw emotions. But for him to walk over and and have a go at Bottas after the, that size of a crash was, I thought. Little question, and he did apologise. That's the thing to remember. He did it. He did apologise and say, "Do you know what? It, it was a big crash. Tensions were high, so that's that's acceptable." He has come forward and apologised. But um, coming back to the Mercedes seat, I I don't think Bot- I think Bottas knows his his time is up in that seat. 
I think the, the bigger question that people are sort of forgetting is why was Russell going to overtake Bottas in the first place? Because nice. like he's in the Williams. They both got Mercedes engines, but Bottas is in a, a car that's won the championship for the last seven years in a row. And the I team. think the thing with that is Hamilton, after the red flag, was ninth, was he not? Around yes, ninth. Yes. Hamilton cut through that pack like a knife, a hot knife through butter. In seemingly the same car um, as Bottas, and Bottas could not get part. Who was he? It was stuck behind. Can't even remember. He was stuck behind. I think it was Gasly. It was Gasly for, for about thirty laps, and he just yeah. couldn't get past him. Yeah, maybe he thought that there was nothing. You know, no, no, he wasn't going to get on the podium, so he thought he would just sit there, but. You see, that's what happens. You have to move forward. We'll go to the start of the race because uh, that, that was a big incident, and we might touch on it a bit further into the episode. But it was mixed conditions at the start. Some of the track was dry, some of it was wet. None of the teams really knew what what to do. When you were you know, sitting watching that, um, before you seen the tires the teams were putting on, were you thinking, yeah, it's, it's going to be a wet race? Put the entries on, or do you think there'd be some that? We chance it with with the slick tires. When I saw the pictures that half the track was drenched and half of it was dry, I was thinking that's that's surely wet. But then as as the session came close to the start of the race, you kind of realised that if you were on wet, as Gasly proved, you were just going to drop off because the track was going to dry because it stopped raining. Um, but it was it was a great recipe for a, an interesting start of a race. Nonetheless, it was. It's mixed conditions. It's what F, to I think, when F1 is at its best. Yeah. Mixed conditions. I've always seen Charles Leclerc go off on the formation lap. I was thinking that could be him out of the race. He's not going to get going. But he, he did. And it, it was definitely an interesting start because we didn't really know what was going to happen. I was I, expecting carnage at the start. I was as well. I was thinking of a certain Russian driver going straight into the barrier. Or spinning before he got there, but then <laughs> yeah, he don't, he don't want to get through the formation. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll give him credit this weekend. He's he had a good weekend. It only took him sixty two laps to to spin. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> um, tick. Yeah, then we'll take that one off. Um, I think we'll full segment on later, but we'll we'll try our best not to get in, in trouble a lot. Um, but yeah, Max Verstappen had a really good start. Um, but then. Obviously, there was the incident with Lewis Hamilton going over the over the curves, damaging the front wing. What was your take on that? My first reaction was Max has jumped the start because it was that good. You don't see starts that good in those conditions. It was very... The start it reminded me of was Senna in Donington. I think it was 1994, I think. Um, he just went. And Red Bulls are notorious for having bad starts. So I was yeah. amazed to see Verstappen up the inside of Hamilton into turn one. The, whether it... T- to me, Hamilton was alongside going into the corner. So... And you can see that on the helicopter shot. Verstappen should have given him more room. Um, obviously, the stewards decided racing incident. Um, but, yeah, I wasn't... I'm not sure on the start. I don't know what your take on it is. So what? See, I don't really know because I thought when I was watching I was thinking... You know, brilliant start from Verstappen. He, he's done well. I didn't think he jumped it. I, I didn't even cross his mind until you just said it. Um, I didn't even know Verstappen. I thought it was Perez. Um, going into that corner, I was thinking that's a mistake from Perez. You know, he, he's misjudged the breaking zone. He's he's hasn't really worked out the work for the Red Bull. And then Hamilton, I thought he was closed in, but I don't know. I think Hamilton, if he knew he was he was going to be caught, I think could have avoided that curve altogether yeah he could have done and the camera angle that completely changed my mind was on board with max yeah i haven't seen that because quite often in in the past you've seen max turn right in the left hander Mm -hmm. to obviously pressure the other car out a bit more he is his steering remained left Mm -hmm. so he's the the reason why he's gone that deep into the corner was i think he had a bit of oversteer which has caused him to push Hamilton over. And obviously the stewards would have seen that. Um, hence the racing incident call. But no, I was I was amazed to see that Red Bull go off the start like that. Yeah, Do you, do you think if that ha- incident had happened lap 
63, that that would have been a, a penalty for Luke Mid-race, Draper. Mid-race, that's a, that's a penalty. It's You didn't leave the driver enough room. Yeah. And there's uh, the FA going with the whole you know, first, first lap. First few laps, we let, we let yeah. a few things slide. Well, there was, on the lap two, there was an incident where next to the TV was sent into the wall by everyone's uh, favourite Russian driver, but I don't think we can blame him for this one. No, we can't. When I first saw it, I thought, he's just T-boned him. And then you saw the replay and you think, actually, Latifi's gone off, come back on, and taken all of the track, while Mazepin's trying to... No, he, no fault yeah. for me. As, I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, that's not actually his fault. Yeah, <laughs> that was a nice change. Um, lap four, we've seen the other um, has be involved in an incident, Mick Schumacher going under the wall to put exit. And... He forced the, the pit lane exit to be closed, which means he had to go around for two laps and no front wing. Not that it would make too much of a difference in the Haas anyway. Ooh, <laughs> ouch! <laughs> he, he done well as a safety car anyway, so he didn't yeah. really lose too much. Um, the, the problem is, the minute the pit lane's closed, if you have an accident in the pit exit, you obviously can't go into repair, like you said. Mm-hmm. But the way the safety car will work is they will release the pack from the safety car once the debris is cleared. And obviously, once the debris is cleared in the pit exit, it's a safe racetrack. So the safety car can go, but Mick still couldn't pit until yeah. the pack had gone round again, yeah. which hampered him more than um, losing your front wing and hitting the wall usually would do. But no, it was a, a strong strong drive from Mick, I think. And to be fair, from Mazepin as well, it was both rookies in that car, which is an absolute horrible thing to drive yeah. um, no I thought they did. They both did very well no they, they, they both did as you said it's, it's not a nice car I know we joke about it being one of the worst cars in the grid but they are two rookies and they're still inexperienced and yep. you know, we've seen Sonoda go off and all the rookie in qualifying it's it's difficult and it's don't, not forgetting the other rookie that spun during the race Who's the two time world champion oh, rookie yes. you yes. had a little incident down at um, Peritella yes. I think yes um but yeah, it, it's definitely difficult for all rookies, no matter if you're a young driver or not, or yeah. whether you qualify for pre-season tests or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, um, we've seen Sergio Perez being given the 10 second time penalty for deciding that he would go off and then overtake cars to regain positions. Something that a driver has experienced, he should know that you don't do that. It's a slam dunk penalty. Yeah, I think it w- that was the start of uh, the Perez's weekend starting to slowly unravel itself. Because, and not only that, Red Bull should have been on the radio as well, telling him you can't overtake yeah. there. It was when the telemetry came up, went 10 seconds stop go penalty. I was like, that can't be right. That's a 50, that's nearly a 50 second penalty here. Yeah. It's the longest pit lane on the calendar. So, and then obviously they changed that. So, yeah, it was, it was a rookie, mis- not a rookie mistake, but it was, it was a mistake you wouldn't expect a driver of Perez's caliber to make. No, um, and then we see Mercedes tried to over a couple Lewis Hamilton, which which backfired for them a bit. Um, do you think that they should have? If, do you think that was the right strategy if it had have come off correctly? Going onto the dry the dry yeah, tires. It was, it was a slow pit stop for him as well. Yeah, um, I think Hamilton is very very good at driving very worn inters. We saw that in um, Turkey last season. Um, and I think we saw that again in Imola because Hamilton was reeling him in very quickly on the worn inters. Um, and had he not had that um, slow stop or that kerfuffle with Russell, I reckon Hamilton could have won that race. It was a race Hamilton usually wins in those kind of conditions. But no, I think the overcut worked. It was just the incident where he slid off the track, which cost him the win, I think. Yeah, what what do you take of that? Do you think, um, you know, when when he stopped, he stopped before the wall. Then do you think he was trying to hit reverse? He had first gear and went straight on, or do you think that's, that was just the car? Going he that might way? have been trying to flick spin the car. That's just possible. So to get the rear parallel with the wall. Yeah. But in gravel, you're not going to get the no. the the slip to get the rear to spin round. He just went forward. 
because I saw, and then there was the question of why hasn't he been done for reversing onto the track? I, I said as soon as because you happened, can't reverse onto the yeah. race onto the circuit. I think probably what helped him there was the incident that happened you know, shortly after, and that was the the Russell Bottas incident. Yeah. I think the stewards sort of had to look at that more, and obviously for the safety of the drivers rather than a car reversing on the track, there was no one around him at that stage. Um, I think if there had been a car coming up, because we've seen, I think. Was it last year or the year before Vettel tried to rejoin the track and Stroll coming along? Well, it was Stroll, St- Stroll did it first. It was Monza 2019. Mm-hmm. It was Stroll did it first. Vettel moaned at him and said, I'm going to show you exactly what he did and then did it to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it, if it had it been a different corner, maybe a bit of a quicker one, because I think it was turn seven turn six or seven the hairpin where he did it it might have been a different story but I I, I don't know it wasn't even looked at which surprised me I thought it yeah. w- was going to get looked at I, I think it would have been if the Bottas Russell incident didn't happen I agree with you um, yeah I completely agree we, we have to, we have already touched on that incident but it's still mental to think that you know, this was Ru- this could have been Russell's chance to prove to Mercedes that look I've over I've already overtaken Bottas and Secure I think I've won overtake of the year last year oh that well, should have done yeah that's and filthy it, last year <laughs> and then uh, obviously he would have overtook him in a car that you know was, was was the worst car in the grid last season against the car that won the championship do, do you think that if Russell had have cleanly done the overtake um, or not went on the grass went the other side or or just didn't collide um, do you think that Mercedes would be starting to think, you know what, we've actually got a driver here, or would have just been? I think Mercedes are already thinking that. I'll be amazed if Russell is not in that Merc next year. It, I re- my my money is on Hamilton, Russell, and Mercedes next year. If Hamilton likes the new cars, he'll do another year. Yeah, I had the laugh yesterday that, um, and we'll we'll talk about it uh, very quickly at the end of the podcast. But the new and uh, eighteen inch rim uh, tires. And uh, Twitter put up you know a big picture of Hamilton in front of the white tire going uh, Hamilton looking at his uh, his pit stop or, or pole position, pole position board. But they forgot that he's only got one year contract. He's yeah. not with the team next year. Well, unless we could go really deep into yeah, the so analysis and go, what do they know yeah, that we don't? Ex- exactly. What haven't they told us? We're on undercover somewhere. We'll have to look that one up. Yeah. Have to, we'll have to try and see. Dig into it a bit deeper. Indeed. See what else the race saying. Um, yeah, I think we just talked about the wonderful drive from Hamilton to get back up to P2. Well, I think it, uh, as well, I think we've got to mention Lando Norris. Yes, indeed. Lando Norris had, that is his first podium he's deserved on merit. Yeah. Not through penalties or through um, post-race um, time penalties that have been added on. Norris, to me, drove a race-winning race yeah. on Sunday. He was fantastic. His defence against Hamilton was brilliant. Picked his line, stuck to it, didn't move in the braking zone. It was fantastic. Norris, to me, was the driver of the weekend. Cause, and then, obviously, Ricardo had to swallow his ego a little bit and let Norris through. Had he not done that, would he have been on the podium? Probably not. So, obviously, Ricardo's still learning that the learning the ropes on the the MCL thirty five B, I think. Yeah, that's what it's called. Um, thirty five M is it not? Ah, uh, yes, yes, it's the M. M. The yes. Red Bull's the B. Yes. Yes, there we go. Um, but yeah, no Norris. Norris was fantastic. He was. I think he's really sort of living up to the expectation that people have seen the last few years. You, you have Daniel Ricciardo coming in, who's a fantastic driver, and has shown that seven race victories is it if not, yeah, if not more you know, he was coming in to be the big experienced driver and then Norris has really sort of been that team leader Soon, I think so far the two rounds he's been the better driver Norris's it, raw pace is incredible Yeah, when that car works and it's really in, in the grooves that car is a race winner and I, I, I will th- I do think they will win a race this year yeah I agree with that I just wonder um, with the whole McLaren using the Mercedes engines. Have they snuck any you know, sort of contract in there that one of the drivers can potentially go to Mercedes down the line? Maybe. I mean, Andreas Seidel has been 
talking more with Toto Wolf about working with the two teams, obviously with the power unit and and things like that. But Norris is a he's a cracking talent. Yeah. And he's got a very bright future ahead of him. He's got a huge fan base as well behind yeah, he him. Has. The whole team quadrant and stuff. He's he's bringing in a new generation of fans and you know, I know you know, Hamilton has this big low reach, but he's not everyone's favourite driver. People no. there's a lot of people who don't like him. Where there is people who don't like Norris for because Norris he can be quite outspoken at times and he can make mistakes, but he's he's still a young driver, yeah. And he's he he rules up the ranks very quickly. End of Formula One, I think did he, he replace Alonso didn't he? He replaced Brando and Russell. They had a complete new lineup didn't they? Yeah, because it was. Um Alonso Van Dorn yeah. and then the next season it was Norris Sainz yeah so he, he had a lot to live on and since Sainz Norris come in they've just gone for strength of strength yeah. McLaren I two think. very good young drivers and the, the appointments as well of Andrea Seidel and stuff I think that was well Andrea, uh, to, uh, to me Andrea Seidel is the best team principal on the grid at the minute he is fantastic and what he's done to that McLaren team is incredible yeah, their their team is just getting better and better. It's going from strength to strength. I wonder. I was, I was thinking earlier. There's still chat about Total Wolf. You know, stepping back from Mercedes very shortly. I wonder will he go to Williams and just bring them up because he he still has st- he's a stakeholder in Williams still is he? Yeah, he still holds the st- he holds stakes in Williams. Just just bring them up if McLaren are right. You could have Williams McLaren fighting at the at the front for ones again. Yeah, that'd be nice to see. Uh, that would uh, indeed would be, be nice to see. But as you mentioned, though, Hamilton's charge through the pack was... It was classic Hamilton. Yeah. Pace was incredible. Overtakes were fantastic. Put the car in the right place, right time. And he he cut through that pack. And I, I maintain he would have won that race had he not had that slight mishap with Russell. Yeah. I think for, for Hamilton, what the big benefit for him was the red flag. Yes, massively. Without that, I don't think he would have been on the podium next no, he would have been lapped down at yeah. that point very unlikely he probably would have even got into the points at that stage he might have just scraped 8th or ninth. yeah I reckon he'd have scraped the lower points yeah but to see it reminded me a lot of Silverstone 2018 when he obviously that was a spill out in the first lap for yeah. the first second or third corner but he just broke his way through the pack but this time he had so little time to do it as well no it, w- it was an impressive drive very impressive I think it just showed how good of a race he was having that he only dropped to ninth. Because you know, we've seen drivers crash out and they're, they're down the bottom, having yeah. to put their two laps down. He, I think he, he was very impressive, and I think that's the experience of seven times. That's what we Hamilton said earlier on. It's a bad weekend for Hamilton, his second place. Yeah, and obviously at the end of the race, you, he got that fastest lap as well. So he Which still kept him in the lead of the world championship. Yeah, because um, you know, I was preparing the graphics and stuff for the website and the socials, and I was ready to have you know, for for Stappen to go to top of the driver standings, Red Bull to be top in the standings. He's never led the standings, has he? No, for Stappen. And if Hamlin keeps up the way it is, he probably won't this season. Portimao will be very interesting, I think. Yeah, I think one team that did really well. I'd say the ones we've already mentioned is Ferrari. We have mentioned them for qualifying, but a fourth, fifth place finish in the race for Ferrari, a team that last season were shocking. They were down the back. We're not not down the back, but they're fighting for just the bare minimum. I think it points. shows how how heavily Ferrari were penalised by the FAA last year. Yes, with their engine regulations, mm-hmm. because you don't find that much pace in one season. No, and that's that's something I think we discussed and others discussed is. You know, we don't know what was that you know, the agreement between them I hope we find out at some point I, ho- I hope we do because I think I think we should well, it, sh- it, it should never have been a signed deal no kept private but that's a whole different kettle of fish they could release that in agreement to the European Super League at the same time keep everyone happy yeah there we go <laughs> yeah keep both sides knock all the happy. cans off the shelf yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you remember when uh, Formula 1 tried to have sort of a football style Super League they had like Liverpool livery cars, Chelsea livery cars, and stuff racing. There was something it was years ago. I think it only lasted a few races. Oh, when all the big sponsors got involved. Yeah, with the, yeah. It, it, I think it was a bit of a disaster. Yeah. Same as the A one Grand Prix and <laughs> them sort of knockout things. qualifying. I think they should bring that back for one no, race. <laughs> no, that can stay on the shelf. It was. It's, it's very video game like. 
Well, it just didn't work, did it? No. But I think we're, we're getting a bit sidetracked <laughs> yeah. now. We're going down a rabbit hole. No. But yeah, no. We'll discuss very briefly the Kiel Mazepin. Um, we have discussed it. He had a good weekend. It only took him 62 laps to spin, and that's to be given, uh, given the credit because we thought he was going to be out the first lap. And I did not expect him to make the first lap. You no, know, the, at, at the time of recording, there's, there's a website that tracks how long he's, it's been since his last spin. Um, and at the time of recording, it's been two days, 23 hours, 51 minutes, and 14 seconds. <laughs> that's mainly because there's been no racing since then. Mainly, yeah. Mainly, yeah. but um, you know, there's also the stats that he said eight spins so far. But he only had, the thing I'm most impressed with, he only had one in pre-season testing, and that was day one. Yeah. Day I w- was he in the car all the days, though? No. He was only in day one, wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> That's yeah, why. and then he was in the afternoon on day three, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. Because uh, they split between yeah. the two of them, yeah. I was thinking Philip Halley might have had a run out, but he didn't. He did last year, but not this year. Yeah, I don't think he did. They, they gave him two Grand Prix last year. Yeah. Keep him happy. But yeah, uh, in Imola, he had two spins in FP1. Um, one was right at the end, wasn't it? In one of the sessions. Yeah, about three minutes left in the session. Yeah, just sort of... Final corner. Yeah. And then he had none until the race, to lap 62, so it's an improvement for him. He, yeah, he, and he got the experience of a race program, yeah, I which think I think needed. is the big thing. Yeah, he definitely needed that because he hasn't had... He hasn't had a Grand Prix lap until this race. No, he hasn't. The, the quickest ever exit for a, a driver on his, on his debut. Yeah, it was indeed. And I think the fact Mazepin was quick in F2, we have to remember that. He was a race winner. You might not like him as a person, but he was he was quick and he was up there. Um, th- That's not necessarily translated so far, but I no. think we will see him and Mick start to get a bit more on uh, level terms with each other but again time will tell on that one and we'll, and we'll see how the season goes yeah Schumacher's definitely had the upper hand so far but maybe this Grand Prix experience will be helpful for Madison because he's always been a driver in Formula 2 that just sort of come out of nowhere and he was always there in the top half and was able to scrape from the he's one of those reliable top six yeah um, and as much as you know people don't like the reasons why he's in Formula 1 he's really helping Haas he yeah. has probably wouldn't be on the grid without him. No, they wouldn't. Because you you lose your big drivers of Midas and Grosjean. I don't think either of them really brought too much money to the, the team. Grosjean brought f- more than Magnussen, I believe. Mm. But I think the the team really just needs a fresh start. Yeah. Um, Mazepin obviously has really helped the team. Schumacher's helped with the whole marketability side of things. The old drivers that could have had a Callum Idlot and stuff wouldn't have brought enough money. I think that's the reason they no, not that's the reason they didn't pick Callum because he just didn't bring he didn't yeah. bring enough funding with him. Yeah, and I do hope Haas will stick stick around because I don't think before long they really need especially Richie Energy's mentioned again coming back. Well, that's not that's not really going to happen. Well, we laugh. can hope anyway. Yeah, I had I had the laugh of um on on Twitter with Will Buxton and and Rich Energy. Saying that you know, having the you know, la- send the a gift for them laughing, and then for a January saying, well, well, we'll see you in the track uh, next year. Oh, yeah, of course you will. Yeah, time will tell on that one. Yeah, the, the rumors of Rich Energy and Ferrari are fascinating because that would be probably the greatest you know, turnaround story for Rich Energy to get in with the great. I mean, Ferrari uh, aren't that desperate yet. I don't think. No, I don't think so. Still need to pay off the the car launch from last year. All them dancers. Oh yeah. yeah, and and the FIA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good job. This is like forty odd minutes in this yeah, yeah. lesson on the stage. Yeah, definitely. Um, two bits of Formula One news that come out the last week. One I've already mentioned is that eighteen inch tires. We knew, we knew that was happening in the way, but yeah, Mercedes have been testing the last few they days. Look incredibly good. Yeah. Um. Do Do you think that will be a good thing, or do you think that, as much as they're nice to look at, do you think it's the wrong way for Formula One? Formula One, I think, needs to um, jazz up the cars. I mean, they look amazing now, but you think you look at what Formula E's done with their Gen 2 and Gen 3 car, they look like spaceships. They look yeah. like stuff you'd have on a poster in your bedroom wall. The new cars next year look fantastic, yeah. and I think these 18-inch rims are 
It, it's what the sport needed because you you don't see road cars drive or race cars driving around with really small rims nowadays. Mm-hmm. They're all big rims. It looks great on the cars. Formula 2 had some issues with them, but they worked them out pretty quickly, and I think we're going to see that next year. Some drivers really struggling to get those tyres up to temperature with those um, bigger rims on them. And do you think that the drivers who were in Formula 2 last year, Schumacher, Sonoda, Mazepin, I think that's all, do you think there'll be a big benefit for them? They might have an early advantage first race in the season. Yeah, I can, I can see that happening. Definitely. I think the F2 knowledge of those bigger rims will translate to the bigger Formula 1 rims. But then I think everyone's going to be struggling next year with the whole new aero package. Yeah, it'll probably take a few races for the whole pack to work out. The It'll road take order. a few races for us to iron out and work out, right, they're there, they're there, they're in the middle. And I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting yeah. next year anyway. Testing's definitely going to be interesting because we'll not oh, know anything. Yes. Um, another bit of news, F1 is going to Miami. It's been rumoured for a long time. It was cancelled and now it's, now it's here. What do you think? F1, second race in America, good fit or not? It depends how the circuit's going to look. Because if it's another Sochi or another Saudi Arabia where it's just a street track, you can't overtake, what's the point? Because no one's going to look forward to it. If it's a great track, it's going to be a great track. And obviously there's mods on Assetto Corsa now where you can drive the circuit. And it just looks like one of those circuits where you just can't overtake. Mm. Um even though apparently it's been designed for overtaking, it looks like one of those circuits where you, you're going to struggle to follow cars because it's corner after corner after corner. Not to the level of Saudi Arabia and their circuit, which has about 14,000 corners on it. But no, I think if they can get the track right, it's going to be brilliant. It's going to be a festival. It's a yeah. festival of Formula One. I think they, they sort of describe it as it's like Australia. Like it's the semi permanent. It feels it's a street circuit on a like a permanent course. I think yeah. that's the way to describe it, or something along those lines. But I fear it's going to be very much like Monaco, and I hope it doesn't take away from you know, the Monaco Grand Prix. As this is the big Formula One festival where all the rich celebrities go, and as much as that's not what Formula One's about, I don't think like it will. I think Monaco has its history and it has its heritage. Um, it's just. It's whether America wants to accept Formula One. So that's the big question. Because that's why they're pushing so hard for more American races, because that's a massive market. It's whether they want to get involved with it, though. That's the question. Um, it might make a decision for Gene Haas whether, whether or not he wants to keep his Haas team in. Yep. Because it could be it could be a rich energy. It could be the Mazepins that take it over. And it's highly likely that if Gene Haas doesn't want to be involved, Haas won't be on the grid as, as Haas. There'll be no, something but it else. It won't be Haas if, if Gene Haas walks away. And with, with no American team and no American drivers, it would be a real shame it if they go in Miami. Because at least with, with Monaco now, we've got Charles Leclerc, who hasn't had the best time around there, but he, he will eventually because we didn't even get to go there last year. I feel like. I fear for Formula One in America that it's not going to take off again because we've obviously had the Mitchell entire scandal a few years ago that I think is lasting damage. Yeah, no, that will have done damage, and I it's it's good to see them trying to fix it, but not being funny. We don't need cliche street circuits. No. There are some incredible tracks: Road America, Road Atlanta. You've got um, where was the Indy car this weekend? I've completely forgotten, I've forgotten but that's a, gr- that's a great circuit, you've got Sebring I mean Sebring you couldn't race F1 cars on no, because of the bumps, but there are some fantastic circuits in America I don't know why we're not using those as well, because they're brilliant tracks it was Alabama Alabama, that was the one and then uh, Alex Palau won that he's he did, first win Yeah, he, he's the athlete of talent um, he is indeed and then they're in St. Petersburg this weekend. It's usually the start of the season. Yeah, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg usually starts the season off, but obviously, the um, we're not going to mention the big the big thing that's on everyone's mind as to why seasons aren't starting properly no. and no. and stuff like that. We're just going to crack on with it. Yes, um, and we'll crack on to the predictions now for Portimao. 
the next race uh, this is a week or two weeks time two weeks two weeks time Formula E this weekend yep. in Valencia Big very week. important race yeah. for Formula E um, and then Portugal next the weekend after that definitely looking forward to that so far uh, this year we're keeping track of the predictions because last year I don't even know who, who won the end up I don't think anyone got anything right last year <laughs> <laughs> no we were very much predicting it was a uh, Vettel and, and Leclerc for wins and podiums or, or I was anyway <laughs> well you definitely were I won't I won't take that one but, no. <laughs> um, yeah it was it's an interesting one last yeah. year well we have sco- scored some por- point some points so far this year can even get my words out now um, and the way I'm working it is I'm one team and you and Ryan because you open a podcast you're on one team so you, you know what Ryan's like and his guessing and predicting things from the Christmas special we've done hands tied behind my back as it, <laughs> <laughs> as it is already yeah um, so for Bahrain I predicted a Valtteri Bottas uh, pole position um, and you predicted a Lewis Hamilton pole position yeah that was about right yeah, it was neither of us correct. No, neither of us got that one right. Um, I actually scored two points at the at the Bahrain Grand Prix weekend because um, I got the the final result of Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, one two correct. Then I predicted Daniel Ricciardo didn't quite work. I predicted a Gasly P six didn't come off, and then I predicted Yuki Tsunoda to battle with Fernando Alonso and win. Which he kind of did. Will you let me have that? Because I've yeah, I'll, I'll allow that one. Okay, I'll that's, allow that one. That, that's good because I've borderline give you a point. Um, more yeah. so a f- point for Ryan for his guess. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, uh, for you, for Imla, you also scored two points because you got Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, correct, one two, and then giving this one uh, it is actually uh, your bonus point, uh, a McLaren surprise. They did really well. I yeah, think they, they did. them better. And given their performance this weekend, I think that cements it. So I got two points from Bahrain. You got three points. Give it to you. And then Imola, I put a Valtteri Bottas pool. I mm. did say Perez would be in the front row, but I didn't. like. It's pole position, so I'm not giving myself that one. That was a complete guess, to be honest. Um, you, it was Ryan who was on this podcast as well, so... You have to take my word for it. Um, <laughs> I believe you. Don't okay. worry. For my race result, I put uh, Sergio Perez, Max Verstappen, Valtteri Bottas. Didn't get the correct order. I think we only give points for correct positions because Lewis and Verstappen is pretty much an easy yeah, point every week. Yeah, definitely. And then I put Pierre Gasly. My surprise was to put Pierre Gasly fifth in the race. He finished fifth in qualifying. Didn't finish fifth in the race. Slightly disappointed with that one. So no points from, from Imola. And Ryan's predictions, uh, he predicted Max Verstappen and pole. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Lewis Hamilton won, Max Verstappen second, Daniel Ricciardo third. That was, he, he took my prediction from, from Barry. <laughs> yeah, neither of them happened. And then he, uh, his surprise was Pierre Gasly to finish in the top five. Which he didn't. Which he didn't. But then he, he did also mention that to keep an eye on the Alfa Romeos, who... Did have a decent race. They didn't. I don't they think didn't they didn't score points. They didn't score they points. Got, they got kicked out at the end after the race. Yeah, but they had a decent race. I'll, I'll not give them that one. Nah, no, no. That that can be a end of you know, end of season if we're drawn. Yeah, we can work maybe. it out. We can work it out then. Get the lawyers involved. Yes. <laughs> um, so predictions for Portimao. I'll kick things off. Pole position. Sergio Perez. Wow. Yeah. Why, why wow. not? Um. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Hamilton for pole. Okay. Top three. I'm gonna go. Hamilton, Verstappen, Perez. I'm gonna go. It's, mm, I'm gonna go Hamilton, Verstappen, Leclerc. Oh. That, that's sort of a prediction I would usually make. No, I think Ferrari could have a good. Uh, there, yeah, I think Ferrari could have yeah. a good one. I feel like Perez might have an off weekend. Like if he's had, uh, he had a fairly decent qualifying, especially. Uh, what's the other ones we do? Fastest lap. Oh well. Uh, Fastest lap will be Bottas. He'll pit on with around two to I'm go and put some softs on. The things on the pit. Um, if you went for Bottas, I'll go for. 
Dan Ricardo, why not? And I don't know where. Not a bad guess. Just on his own. Is that all the predictions we do? I think so. I think so. Or are you surprised? Oh, the surprise. This is we're having fun with this one yet. <laughs> um, I don't know. What could we have as a surprise in Portimao? I was going to say Maz. It rains again. I was going to say Maz when the finish race, but he almost he did. He did, so yeah, he did. It that's that one gone. I should have said that one last week. Um, um, I don't know. If it rains, I reckon. I reckon the McLarens will be up there. Well, actually, I reckon the McLarens will be up there anyway. And when we say up there, we'll go from one top of them, five. Top five. Okay, one of them in the top five. If not least, both of them. If not both. In top six. I'm going to go Kimi Reckon will score points. That's good. That's a reasonable guess. Yeah, he, he impressed this weekend before he was kicked out. I, th- I, th- I think he... I think he have a good weekend. Hopefully. It's definitely going to be an interesting race. And, and yeah, it's two weeks' time. Formula E Valencia this weekend. Very interesting race. Street circuit. Uh, route, uh, proper, tr- proper circuit. Proper circuit. Definitely would be interesting to see next time we're on, we're on. We'll probably have a wee tiny chat about that to see if if we think it's damaging Formula One or if it's going to be a good thing for Formula One. We don't or if it's that. damaging Formula E. That's the more important question. Be interesting to see. Um, so, yeah, that is going to bring to the end of today's podcast. Craig, thank you for joining me. It's been enjoyable, this one. Thank you very much for having me back on again and allowing me to ramble on for however long we ramble on for. Yeah, for we're nearly at the mark. Oh, perfect. Perfect yeah. timing then. No, I love coming on and um, yeah, I'll happily yeah. do some more in the future. Yeah, we say every time, but 25 minutes, half an hour, we'll do it. Yeah. We, we, we get the get the qualifying, we finish that, and then we see you know, 15 minutes in, right? Like, right, fine, we can just sit and discuss the race. Yeah, then we just 45 minutes have later. Have a good old chat, don't we? <laughs> yes. It's lovely. Yeah. So yeah, thank you all for, for listening to this one. I'll be out and all you know, the usual, you're, you are listening to it, so it'll be... You have got us some way, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. I think we're on TuneIn Radio. There's there's that many different podcast platforms out there. You if you follow us on all our, our social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and also check out the website. Uh, check out uh, Craig's stuff as well. Craig, do you want to plug your stuff now? Um, yeah, so I've got all my photos on Instagram there under Craig Evans photo, um, no spaces, and yeah, no, it's um. And that's that's mainly where all my stuff is. There's links to the website on there. Yep, yeah, I'll I'll link everything in the description below on way if I, if I remember. Oh, I should do it. We probably haven't this today anyway. So <laughs> fresh in the morning. There we go then. So yeah, thank you all so much for listening, and we hope to see you, or not see. You, I say this every time. We hope to see you. We hope that you'll be here to listen to us in the next one. So yeah, thank you for listening. See you all next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.